Great, uh, let's get started. So it is uh, becoming increasingly clear that the Christmas presents of Comption lawyers and economists will not be physical, but it will certainly be digital uh, with the commission having tabled a proposed initiative on digital markets for somewhere in December. Uh, the initiatives currently named the DSA or the DMA relate to various work streams, which really have two legs. Uh, we know that on the one hand, the commission is trying to introduce a study and remedy tool that will allow it to remedy perceived market, correct, perceived market failures in digital markets and maybe beyond. Uh, in short, the idea is for the commission to switch from Compton police to Compton doctor. We know on the other hand that the European Commission is also interested in having a more horizontal approach to certain types of market behavior by gatekeeping firms trying to prescribe or condition more of that behavior. In, in a way, it's uh, moving Compton enforcement from CSI mode to uh, more traffic ticketing. So what, so we want today uh, here in Florence at the European University Institute to provide um, a forum for a thorough discussion of the various issues that these uh, proposals uh, will, will raise. And we want to do that before they go to uh, the lawmaking institutions of the European Union. So I'll run you very quickly through the program and then I'll tell you a little more about uh, the organizations behind this, uh, this webinar and the speakers and, and we'll uh, kick off uh, without further ado. So the program today is basically divided in really what are four panels. Uh, one, the first panel will deal with institutional and procedural issues. The second panel, which will start after a recess between 12 and 1, will be devoted to the interplay between the new legislation and sector-specific regulation in the EU. The third panel will be uh, devoted to substantive theories of ARM driving and underpinning these various initiatives. And the fourth panel will be a more um, open-ended uh, discussion um, may be guided by the experience that uh, uh, led uh, the European Commission in the past to have a more horizontal approach to business behavior and, and what there is to learn from, from that history. There will be a bunch of concluding remarks and we will have the great delight to, to welcome Andreas Schwab, member of the European Parliament, to deliver a keynote speech to close uh, this uh, event today. Okay, so a word maybe about uh, what is really behind in terms of the organization of this event. So a lot of people know the European University Institute, but a lot of people do not know that there are a lot of uh, uh, organizations within the European University Institute involved in looking at digital markets, involved in thinking about Compton policy. And this event is really, really in essence, an attempt to have all these uh, 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 units or departments within the Institute to work together and uh, deliver um, an agenda and some thinking and a space for uh, reflection. So the, the various organizations behind this event are the, of course the Florence Compton program, which, which really uh, um, um, you know, took most of the um, logistical uh, challenges uh, um, related to that event uh, on its shoulders. It's also a sort of informal cooperation with the EU Commission Law and Policy Workshop, which usually takes place in June every year in Florence. Didn't happen this year, but will happen uh, again next year uh, in full force. It's also um, an initiative that was coordinated by the Cluster on Technological Change in Society, co-directed uh, by Giacomo Calzolari from the Econ Department and Giovanni Sartor from the Law Department, and last but not least, with the Competition Law Working Group of the, of the EUI. We will send links in the chat to these various organizations so you can see the wealth of expertise that Florence has to offer when it comes to discussing competition policy. We really want uh, in the future at the UI to provide again, a relevant place where people can debate in a trusted environment 
um, in a constructive way and uh, in a polite and civil uh, um, spirit. So there will be more to come, and uh, this event is uh, is just a first uh, a first um, uh, initiative that tries to that tries to to provide a little bit of that philosophy. Okay, now. Uh, enough about uh, today's events and uh, enough about details about organizations and uh, on to the, the speakers and this first panel. So our uh, main speaker for the panel is Professor Heike Schweitzer. Heike is a professor at the Law Faculty of Humboldt University in Berlin. Her main research interests are well known. Uh, she focuses on German and European competition law, as well as US antitrust, state aid, telecommunications, and internet law. Heike was uh, one of the co-authors of the author on, you know, shaping competition policy for digital markets with Jacques Kremer and Pierre-Yves de Montjoie. But Heike uh, more recently has penned uh, one of the various expert reports that the European Commission, if I understand correctly, ordered to develop the policy that it has in mind for digital markets. This report is called the new competition tool, its institutional setup and procedural design. You can not see it here because my virtual background prevents you from seeing it here, but I have it in my hands and it's a really, really excellent piece of work. So Ike was uh, my predecessor um, some time ago in Florence and it's a delight to, to be uh, there chairing this panel. Uh, with her here it, in a way she's coming back to Florence and we hope that there will be occasions for her to come back in the future in the flesh uh, at the Institute. Our second speaker or commentator if I may say is Asimakis Komninos, uh, a well-known uh, a well-known member of the antitrust bar in Brussels. Uh, Makis is a partner with the law firm White and & Case and uh, is also active in various forums and for us, sorry. And uh, if, I, if I remember well, uh, Makis is also an NGA uh, in the context of the, of the ICN. Makis has been following the digital uh, industry discussion um, very closely in the past years and is one of um, the best experts on the application of antitrust to digital markets. He was the chair of the working group of the European Commission Lawyers Forum, which made submissions to the EC related to that exercise. So um, I said enough. Now it's time for Heike Schweitzer to uh, lead the discussion with a 20 minutes presentation. And then Mikey will join with comments. We'll have a lot of time for Q&A. So hold your fire, but prepare it. Thank you, Nicola. Uh, when I look at your background, I'm really sorry I cannot be there. <laughs> so, um, but uh, let me try to upload my slides. So the conference title is the Digital Markets Act, and I'm going to talk about the new competition tool. The, so the first thing I should do is to try to clarify the relation between the two. The focus of the Digital Markets Act is or will be, as far as I understand, some sort of ex-ante regulation of the big uh, digital platforms. And to my knowledge, it is yet unclear whether the new competition tool for digital will be, uh, whether th there will also be a new competition tool for digital or digitally enabled markets as a complement introduced into this Digital Markets Act. So, uh, of course, uh, th there will be some certainty at the Commission level. I don't know whether this will be the case. Um, the initiative for introducing a regime of ex ante regulation for some digital platforms and the initiative for introducing a new competition tool are two separate initiatives, although they are, of course, uh, complementary in some ways. And according to the inception impact assessment for a new competition tool, the new competition tool was not necessarily meant to be limited to digital markets. The uh, Digicomp alternatively envisioned a horizontal scope for the new competition tool. It seems that now, if the new competition tool comes at this moment, it will be part of the Digital, Digital Markets Act and it will be limited to digital or digitally enabled markets. It can be either a dominance-based tool, so addressed only to dominant companies, or it may be a market structure-based tool, and I don't know which of those two it will be if the new competition tool comes. 
there is of course a possibility that the new competition tool may be introduced at a later point of time in a broader setting. Maybe if we review regulation one uh, 2003 at some point of time, there will be a new discussion about the new competition tool. At this moment, we will, of, will it seems, go with a sectoral approach, which of course raises the challenge to define digital markets or digitally enabled markets, or at least the scope of this, this tool. And I don't know how this will be solved in the Digital Markets Act. So let's start with the question, why would we need a new competition tool? And this is a question that will be addressed more in detail by uh, Martin Peitz later on. It is addressed in the, in the separate report by Massimo Motta and Martin Peitz. But then form follows function and procedural law must fit the goal uh, pursued by substantive rules. So I have to say, I have to say something very briefly about the goals of the new competition tool at the beginning. So the new competition tool shall allow the commission to remedy competition problems that do not follow primarily from conduct, but from specific features of the market. Also, this tool is meant to uh, allow the, comp uh, the commission to address competition problems in a particularly timely and effective manner, and to enable the commission to address the root cause of the identified competition problem. So the goal to allow a specifically tiny intervention means that speed will be a defining feature of the new competition tool. And this means there must be strict deadlines. There must be a very efficient procedure, although it should still be a flexible procedure. Possibly there will also be a possibility for interim measures within this procedure. An effective intervention presupposes that there is a very efficient form of information gathering um, within this new competition tool procedure. And there must be an efficient access to the file procedure because access to the file can keep up a proceeding for a long time. And then the goal to address the root cause of the competition pro problem means that there will need to be effective remedies. And I will look at uh, those points a bit later on. Of course, the new competition tool shall not give up on analyt analytical rigor. Uh, so this shall still be um, a, a disciplined analysis that uh, shall take place within the uh, framework of the new competition tool. And of course, we have to take care of procedural rights, which are guaranteed by the Charter of Fundamental Rights. I will say a bit about that later on. It seems uh, uh, what, what's quite clear is that the new competition tool will differ in, in its procedural um, setup from the infringement procedure, infringement procedure in one, one important way. It shall be a purely administrative procedure. It shall not require the establishment of an infringement. And that means it will not be a quasi-criminal quasi procedure, contrary to what we know from the classical uh, infringement procedures. Ideally, this would allow the procedure to become less adversarial, to be more participative, to allow for more cooperation with the companies. But at the same time, of course, it does affect the procedural guarantees. Article 41 of the um, uh, Charter of uh, Fundamental Rights, the right to be heard, access to the file, uh, right to a reasoned decision, and also Article 47, um, judicial review will still apply. So all these rights remain in place, but there will be no presumption of innocence, of course, because it's not a quasi-criminal procedure. There will no be, no, uh, be, not be nebis in idem, or this uh, principle will not apply. So there are important differences in this regard. The question then is, and was for me when I wrote this report, how to develop competition meets these goals. And we have some models, of course, there is regulation one, 2003, there is the uh, procedural rules in place for merger control. Uh, and and they, they have guided what I have done. Also, there is the CMA market investigation procedure in the UK, which has been kind of a role model for the new competition tool. But then again, the institutional setting in the UK differs quite a bit from the institutional setting in the EU. So you cannot simply legally transplant uh, this procedure from the UK to the EU. What I will now do is to focus on a couple of points. Uh, the first point will be some conceptual questions for the new competition tool. What is the legal nature of the new competition tool? Is it competition law really, or is it regulation? How does it interact uh, with Article 101 and Article 102? Then uh, some brief words on the set of the, 
setup of the procedure on remedies and on interim measures. Let's start with the legal nature of the new competition tool. Is it competition law or is it regulation? The new competition tool, if it comes, will be quite a bold move for competition law. Um, so far, we have tried to distinguish very clearly between competition law and regulation. Now, the new competition tool, in some respects, would add an instrument of small-scale ex-ante regulation to the toolbox of competition law. The new competition tool tries to implement goals that are pure competition law goals. It shall protect competition, the competitive process, but it reacts to a broader set of market failures than can potentially distort the competitive process. For example, information asymmetries, market failure that we have traditionally not primarily addressed by way of competition law, but by way of other branches of law, unfair competition law, consumer protection law, and so on. Also, the new competition to uh, tool shall allow us to uh, address risks to competition, not to intervene once an abuse or an uh, infringement has taken place, but to act before upon a precautionary principle. And then the remedies imposed will not be meant to put an infringement to an end, but to fix an underlying market failure. And this, this uh, is an important change, I, as I will um, explain later on. So how does this competition tool interact with Articles 101 and 102? So my starting point here is that Article 101 and 102 impose intervention thresholds for a reason. They have tried to establish clear conduct rules for companies that allow companies to plan. They have also tried to reduce error costs, uh, the risk of false positives. So there are good reasons why we where we had uh, rules that contained, arguably contained gaps. Um, now, the new competition tool shall close some of these gaps. And the question is, how should they relate to Article 101 and 102? And one, sh I would argue that they should not replace Article 101 and 102. They shall close some gaps, but not, um, not uh, yeah, not replace Article 101 and one, Article 102. So um, a possible argument that could be made could be we apply them according to a subsidiarity principle or we apply the new competition tool according to a subsidiarity principle. Uh, we check whether Article 101 and 102 can fix the problem. If not, the new competition tool comes in. But this will not work. If we were to do that, then the new competition tool would lose its meaning because uh, DGCOM would need to run an Article 101, 102 procedure before activating the new competition tool. And then the whole advantage of having a quick procedure uh, in place will be lost. So with no subsidiarity principle in place, Article 101 and, and Article 102 enforcement should still arguably, I would argue that, remain the rule. Um, it is important um, to have the Article 101 and 102 sanctions, and, uh, sanctions in place and not having them replaced by NCT interventions. NCT interventions should be limited to special cases. What one could do in order to uh, make that happen is to use a broad criterion for opening NCT proceedings. One could, of course, would, could, for example, argue that the, new, uh, the com uh, Commission can open a NCT proceeding when there are adverse effects on competition, very broad, but complement that broad criterion by a list of examples, as we do in Article 101 and 1, Article 102. Also, I would argue the EU Commission should explain why it makes use of the new competition tool and not of Article 101 and 102. And in the end, I would believe that the new competition tool will be limited to some extraordinary cases already because these proceedings will be quite resource intensive. So there cannot be an unlimited unlim number of these types of proceedings. There's a different question regarding the interaction between the NCT and Article 101, 102. And this relates to the overlap between a European NCT and a national Article 101 and Article 102 proceeding. Of course, there must be some coordination between these types of proceedings and the European Competition Network must extend its coordination principles to this new tool. Obviously, conflicting remedies should be avoided and 
I, I guess that Article 101 and 102 proceedings at the national level will be suspended once an NCT proceeding is opened at the European level. But there is another problem. The new competition tool proceeding shall be a more cooperative, cooperative proceeding, so more cooperation of the com companies is called for, but companies will not be willing to cooperate when the information gathered during the NCT proceeding can later be used against them in a national infringement proceeding. And the same, of course, is, uh, is true for private damage claims. So one might think about a rule that um, no fines should be imposed by NCAs after the closer, closure of an NCT proceeding if the core of the NCT proceeding overlaps with the core of the Article 1 and Article 1 and Article 2 proceeding, Article 101 and 102 proceeding at the national level. At the same time, of course, Articles 101 and 102 will remain fully applicable. Uh, they are primary law after all. What will the procedure look like? Here's the structure of the proceeding as I see it. There would be an initial inf informal scoping phase. There would then be an opening decision. And then from then on, I would say there could be two different paths for such a proceeding. And uh, the path would depend on the remedies envisioned by the commission. If the remedies envisioned shall be addressed to a selected group of undertakings, they would have an evidence gathering phase one of a maximum of 12 months with a possibility of one of six months extension. This proceeding, this phase one, will, could end either with a closure of the proceedings or with a rough informal summary of the findings of the theories of harms explored and of some bright line principles for suitable remedies. So if the proceeding goes on, then we would have a second phase uh, after that, again, maximum of 12 months, but with a possibility of a one of uh, six month extension. During this phase, the uh, state of play meetings with the companies that would be the potential addressees of the remedies would take place. There could be commitment negotiations, there can be further evidence gathering, there can be market consultations or a possible market testing of remedies. And then. At the end of the phase two, a provisional draft decision would be sent to the potential addressees of the remedies. They would be granted access to the file, and in the end, the uh, decision would be published. That would be one version. The second version would be, uh, or the second version of the procedure uh, uh, could take place when market-wide remedies are considered that are that are addressed to all the market players. For example. Uh, they all market players shall provide some sort of information to consumers or uh, there shall be a certain interoperability requirement imposed on all, something like that. So again, there would be an initial evidence gathering phase one, but after that phase, a provisional findings report could be published that pre presents the evidence gathered, the theories of harms ex harm explored and potential remedial options. And after that, then the proceeding could either be closed or it, phase two would be opened. And uh, phase two would then encompass informal consultations on the findings and on remedial options. And in the end, the decision would be published. Now, why are these? Why do I consider that there should be these two procedural options? The commission considers to impose remedies upon a limited number of selected market participants, access to the file and hearing requirements under article 41 of um, the Charter of Fundamental Rights will need to be observed and also confidentiality will be uh, to be maintained. Um, so this limits the possibility to publish a report, an interim report after phase one. But if we have market-wide uh, market remedies, my argument would be that Article 41 of the Charter of Fundamental Rights as such would not be applicable. There would still be a need for transparency, but it could be a somewhat lighter transparency regime. So we could here uh, publish the interim report, make the findings more transparent, allow for a more for a broader discussion of the theories of harm and the remedies at an earlier point of time. And that could be to, uh, to the advantage of the commission, but also of the companies in the market. All in all, the NCT proceedings shall not take more than two years under a normal schedule with a possibility of a prolongation by no more, no more than one year in total. Still, so it's all in all three years uh, as a maximum. Still, this is a very ambitious timetable for potentially very complex proceedings. 
which means that the procedure must be aligned to the need for speed. There will be strict deadlines for the commission for the different steps in the proceeding. Um, there must be a possibility to import information from the national competition authorities or from other proceedings at the EU level. I would argue that companies should have a broader duty to cooperate uh, with the commission um, because there is no the, the problem of uh, um, of uh, self uh, it is not a quasi criminal pro proceeding so companies can be required to cooperate in a more intense way they could of course for example be required uh, to discuss with the commission before the commission issues requests for information uh, what type of data is available what the structure of the data is how an algorithm works and all of that also we will need efficient access to the file proceeding maybe there could be a mandatory confidentiality rings ring um, at the moment the, there is a possibility already in infringement proceedings to have a uh, non-mandatory confidential ring but in this proceeding maybe the mandatory version could be a possibility and there should be a possibility for interim measures of course remedies are essential for an effective intervention and these remedies must or should ideally address the root cause of the competition problem identified they are not meant to just put an infringement to the end but to really address the root cause um, these remedies must be suitable to address the competition problem I identified. They must be proportionate. They should be forward-looking, address the market failure as such, and to make remedies function more competitively, uh, make the market function more competitively. Fo arguably, the focus of such remedies would be to reduce barriers to entry and expansion, ensure contestability, reduce incentives to coordinate, and, and things like that. In order to effectively address the root cause of a competition problem, the Commission will need flexibility, so they should have available the whole breadth of remedies that we know of, behavioral, structural, access remedies, and so on. And I would argue that there should be a possibility to adjust remedies, not only in case of a material change in the facts on which a decision was based, we know that from Article 9 of Regulation 1, 2003, but there should also be a possibility to adjust remedies where they prove to be inadequate with a view to the goals. This is a possibility that's currently discussed in England uh, as an extension or addition to the market investigation procedure there. And I think it should be a good idea also for the European level. And then last but not least, the interim measures. If um, a very speedy intervention is needed and if the NCT is to allow that speedy intervention, then interim measures will be required Think of a situation where the market is in risk of tipping and you want to intervene. You cannot wait three years in that such a case, but you have to intervene directly. And that would the, the means to do that would be interim measures. Um, of course, uh, you would need to uh, use interim measures, possibly at an early point of time in the proceeding, if, if this is the case. Uh, harm the the theory of harm must still be substantiated, but uh, the pre precise requirements will depend on the expected harm and the time of the time of action. So there will be kind of a flexible um, uh, flexible requirement in this regard. If serious harm to competition is to be prevented effectively, the requirement that interim measures must only be of conservatory nature. A requirement that they not know from interim measures in infringement proceedings cannot be upheld in all cases. Sometimes interim measures must go beyond. There is one advantage, maybe, maybe some would consider it a disadvantage from interim measures. Uh, interim measures may strengthen the willingness of companies to cooperate. And since cooperation is really um, a goal of this whole new competition tool, this may be an advantage with a view to the functioning of this procedure. So this for now, and I look forward to your comments, Marcus. Thank you very much, Aika. Marcus, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, it's a pleasure again to be at the UI. Um, I'm, um, um, I, I have um, read uh, um, the interesting report of Heike, which I find uh, very well written. Um, there's not much really to disagree with, um, I mean, these are, this is a very neutral uh, report. Um, therefore, I will just uh, proceed with some general comments I have on the 
NCT tool. And this is based um, not only on my experience as a lawyer, and by the way, I'm not representing any views or clients here, uh, but also as um, uh, but also from my experience as an enforcer in a country which has this system, Greece. I mean, I was a commissioner for two years at the Greek Competition Authority. We had we have this system, and I know, let's say, uh, a bit more its uh, um, uh, ups and downs. Let's say. So, what's good with having uh, an NCT? What's what's good with this tool from a competition authority and from an effectiveness point of view? First of all, I mean, the principle of free competition that we have in the treaty is not necessarily only um, remedied or indeed enforced through articles 101 and 102. There may be other um, uh, legislative tools to enforce them, like, for example, we have the state aid rules, or you may have Article 106 in some, okay, on some occasions, you may have uh, 101 and 102 together with Article uh, 4, Paragraph 3 of the Treaty for the European Union in terms of state measures, etc. And there may be gaps. Eh? There may be gaps. You may have uh, oligopolistic structures, for example, or you may have uh, an attempt to monopolize, attempt to reach um, a dominant position, etc. So you may have gaps which are not necessarily covered. Um, in that sense, if the uh, NCT is to um, fill in those gaps, it's a good to have tool. Eh? So uh, any competition authority would, would say, it's good to have that, why not? I mean, now, um, for example, I mean, remember the, the case of the uh, German energy cases, eh? where the European Commission intervened in the end through commitments decisions. It was really mostly a question of structure, if I remember well there. Uh, the Commission managed in the end to get some results through commitments cases, but you know, I, this could have been an, an, an area where um, the NCT tool could have been um, enforced. Why, I mean, what are the negative elements of the, of the NCT tool? Um, first of all, I mean, to somebody who's a competition lawyer, this is a very regulatory tool. So yeah, it may not be regulation as such, but it's very regulatory in nature. It betrays also um, a degree of failure, let's say, of admission of failure that we competition authorities, we competition, the competition milieu has failed in dealing with certain phenomena. It's a tool which is exante. It's not uh, like the exposed tools we have in articles 101 and 102. True, we have merger control, which is also exante, but it's different from merger control because there, Again, the triggering event for the commission or for the national competition authority to intervene is conduct by the undertakings. Certain, con certain undertakings decide to merge or one buys the other. We have a change of control. So the undertakings are still, uh, if you want, controlling the, their fate there. They're doing something. And as a result, of course, you have an exante um, uh, uh, enforcement by, by the authorities. Whereas here, the undertakings will have done nothing in terms of uh, inviting, so to say, the intervention. So it's very exante. Um, it's a tool which can lead to a lot of um, politicization, politicking, and I, I'm speaking here from um, uh, experience. Uh, I can tell you when uh, um, I was at the authority, um, you had always, you know, you always was, we would receive uh, uh, invitations to intervene in, um, in the populist bestsellers, as I would say. In Greece, in those days, the populist be bestsellers were, ah, you have to intervene in the supermarkets. Supermarkets, you know, is one populist bestseller. Another one is gas stations, gas station pr prices. And indeed, the only time the authority um, before my time has intervened is in the gas stations. Check prices, why prices are whatever. Um, so it, politicization is a, um, a, a risk, which for the European Commission obviously is a bit of a less of a risk, but for some national competition authorities, maybe, maybe more. Uh, another uh, issue is that um, if, it, if the tool is abused, in other words, if it's used too many times, if we have too many times um, structural remedies, etc., it may, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that it will, but it may um, undermine the investment climate in certain uh, regions, etc. There may be issues also with um, the international responsibility of states involving uh, 
BITs, if you have uh, expropriation, for example, um, you may have all these kinds of issues. And finally, from a policy point of view, do not forget that what we are doing is copied. So um, if we do that, if we adopt this tool, China will have it next. Huh? Other countries will have it next. Huh? So, you know, there will be spillover effects. Um, so all in all, my view is that it's good to have, but it's, it's really good to have in the same way like um, the US would say nuclear arms are good to have. It's a nuclear weapon. It's good to have, but better never use it, I would say. Or, I mean, in this case, well, nuclear is never use them for sure. But in this case, I mean, if, if, it, if it is used, it has to be, we have to be extreme, it has to be really in extremely rare circumstances. Another point I wanted to raise is, um, um, if we are to have this rule, it is a rule in my view that should be limited only to structure not to conduct. If we, if we um, extend it to conduct, we have an issue, and this is not something that I would recommend. It should be only, uh, it should work only in exceptional cases with questions of structure, not conduct. Why I'm a bit uh, so, I'm, I'm quite um, hesitant to go to conduct, because I fear that it can be abused, and I fear that it can lead to the weakening of existing legal and economic standards we have in Article 101 and 102. So I fear that it can be used as a way to circumvent existing legal and economic standards. Therefore, I would intervene only when we really have a structural issue. Another question obviously is, which is a political question is, should it have general application or should it be sectoral, a digital or digitally, whatever you call them, uh, markets? I think definitely it should have general application in my view. I mean, I find it difficult to have a competition tool which is not of general application. Competition law, there's a lot, lots of case law which explains that competition law has general application. So that is something definitely that I feel strongly about. Um, when it comes to uh, remedies or the outcomes of this tool, I mean, obviously you may have behavioral or structural remedies. You will be surprised to hear from a practicing lawyer that um, 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 I'm, I'm wary of, of behavior, too many behavioral remedies, because again, it smacks of regulation. I mean, if you have this tool always leading to behavioral remedies, etc., it will be a very regulatory rule. If we are to use it once or twice per decade, to be honest, I would go better for structural measures. Because then once you intervene with a structural measure once every 10 years, then at least competition afterwards can work and you leave competition to deal with the issue. You don't become a paternalistic authority always um, you know, uh, regulating about, about the behavior of companies, et cetera. Should we have commitments? Absolutely, yes. Uh, the, the CMA system also has commitments. They call them undertakings in view. Uh, should we have interim measures? Absolutely not. I don't think we should have interim measures because you know that would be um, never seen. I mean, it has never seen before in these cases. In an interim measure is essentially a form of um, expedient intervention when there has been an infringement, an infringement of contract or an infringement of a law or an infringement of something. There is a harm that has to be essentially th that is connected with an infringement and, and ex in a very expedient way it has to be dealt with. Here it's about essentially a form of um, uh, expedient intervention. Well, in those cases, let the legislator intervene expediently in, in such cases. I wouldn't I wouldn't have interim measures here. Finally, judicial review. Um, what should be the standard of review of these decisions or regulations or whatever? Definitely not less than 101 or 102, in my view. As we know, we have a review of legality, but then under the Halcor and the KME cases, in reality, it's more than that. Um, I, it, for me, the issue with judicial review is not the standard of review. For me, the issue is the standing, because you may have products of the NCT. For example, imagine a general application code of conduct. 
I mean, is, are we sure that the, the, the standing rules at the courts allow easily for the undertakings will, which will be on the receiving end to essentially challenge that? And then the other main issue is interim relief at the general court. I think this is something that Heike also uh, caught in her report. We have an issue there. It's extremely difficult to, to get interim, re interim relief uh, before the general court. And that's something that we also need to, to look at. So I'm finishing by just saying that, um, you know, it's a very interesting tool, but uh, be careful what, with what you wish for, uh, because it can backfire. If at all, it should be put in effect very rarely, extremely on, on extremely rare occasions. And obviously, um, we should be careful when it comes to the remedies, because we don't want essentially to create uh, too much uh, regulatory outcomes, but rather to um, essentially make competition work. If competition didn't work, we should, we should allow competition to work, not to regulate. That's all for the time being, thanks. Thank you very much, Makis. Um, thank you for um, these uh, thoughtful comments. So <laughs> it's now time for a set of questions and, uh, and answers. And uh, I will abuse my dominant position by uh, throwing a first set of, of questions. The first one is really a, a yes or no question that I would like to collect uh, just from the outset. So am I right to understand that the two of you are in favor of a broad NCT, not a digitally restricted NCT. Yes? Yes, for me, for sure. Uh, sorry, I, I had to put on my micro. Not sure. I, I think there's an advantage to trying it out in the digital realm and then see uh, what see what, how it works and then uh, go step by step so i'm i'm not against uh, starting with a sectoral approach although i see the difficulties of defining how it is to be used then okay thank you Aika. and and my kiss. um so the the other question that i had came when i was listening to you so um and this is it might look like a more substantive question but it's it is really a legal question so so I heard, Heike, you were saying something like, the idea is to allow us to, or to allow the commission, sorry, to, to go after market failures, which are not strictly within the realm of the market power failures that uh, competition is about, as uh, Jean Tirole would say, or said in his uh, 2015 Nobel Prize speech. And, and then you, you talked about information asymmetries or information problems, which is clearly what Jean Tirole said is outside of the scope of industrial organization. And so, you know, we may have a discussion, you know, whether these market failures have to be dealt with by conscience policy or not. But my question is, that's an economic question. The question is, what can, so the, 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 the instrument, the way you talk about it seems to be that it seems to be designed in a way that the undertakings will will be the subject of remedies. But what can, what can an undertaking provide as a remedy or what can be imposed as a remedy if the market failure is a behavioral bias of its users? And so I, so that's, I think, I'm, to me, that seems pretty, because you can work with remedies imposed on firms to try to, to you know, to, to push them to, uh, you know, change the market structure, restructure them, order them to provide different default options and so on and so forth. But you know, and you may move the needle, but if the issue is really that consumers just are very lazy, aren't you basically ending up to a place where we were 10 years ago when the commission tried really to restructure the, the media player market and the browser market? So that's my question to you. And, and if we leave it to an undertaking targeted remedy, aren't we, aren't we not having the efficiency that we're trying to have? Well, I do think that's that's correct to my understanding that we are uh, moving outside the narrow scope of market power, uh, market failures, market power unilateral or concerted and uh, integrating other types of market failures. Um, what about remedies you ask? Um, and, and this means for, for a lawyer that we really have to rethink the interaction between these different legal 
fields, the legal branches that we have separated so neatly so far um, about consumer protection. And uh, it also means that because if we address a market failure like, um, like information asymmetries, what we will need will arguably market-wide remedies. And this is more something of a legislative remedy. So what about the interaction between legislative competences and the competences of a competition authority? This is something we need to think about. Um, what about remedies? Do we have remedies? I think uh, at least we have some, some remedies we can try. And, and there is the experience from the CMA market investigations, uh, which have at times ordered, for example, the setup of a comparison platform so that users can more easily compare different offers or uh, make it easier for consumers to shift, to reduce um, any um, yeah, barriers to, to switching. Um, so these types of remedies may or may not work. You can try at least. Uh, and, and possibly they can definitely improve uh, the working of competition. So I'm, I'm not in doubt that this can improve the competitive process. I'm, my question is more, how can we ensure that there is, uh, the, the legislator is involved where it should be involved and my proposition in the report was really to say, why not in such cases have a remedy with a sunset clause so that you can react immediately, the competition authority or the DG Com, uh, the commission can react immediately, but then after a period or let, let's say five years, the, either the legislator has reacted had, and has adopted the same instrument or it has not and then it should end. Okay, okay, that helps. The okay that helps. Now I'm I'm turning to to Makis because I think we have a potential disagreement here, and so it might be interesting to 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 see where where the line of disagreement arises. So I'm pretty much I'm pretty much very supportive of the NCT tool in in the sense that I think that it will allow us to get out of the trap of very adversarial flame throwing, you know. Um, settings in which the agency and the firm are basically, you know, throwing a lot of uh, kitchen cutlery at each other, and to to focus on problems. So we are no longer in the sort of game where where we are talking about bad conduct, wrongdoing, evil monopoly. We are talking about okay, we have an issue here. Let's try to look at the context, the problem, rather than than the misbehavior. So I like that. I think that can provide more fruitful ground to achieve market outcomes. And also, so to your point, so I, so I like this idea. And But the, the question is, if we have, if we build in a sufficient amount of procedural and legal protections in the regime, right, aren't we, aren't we actually going to increase the purity of competition law? Because the agency will be Rather than, rather than tinkering with 101 and 102, as we've seen in a bunch of cases, like you know the self-preferencing cases, which really push the boundary of substantive law very far, aren't we going to get rid of that? The sort of you know, behavior in which you see the agency trying to push the boundaries of the law to have a sort of non-adversarial instrument in which the firm and the agency can agree to find solutions when the law is not providing when you know adversarial competition law is not providing solutions, so I'm, I'm wondering if here, rather than seeing, you know, bypass which is bad, we are going to see bypass which is good because it's going to protect the purity of competition law and create a clear process to resolve problems. Yes, I mean it depends. I mean, in theory, it can work as you suggest, but it depends on on how this is put in uh, in effect in practice. Uh, it depends how many proceedings, uh, such proceedings, the Commission uh, goes for. I mean, if, if this becomes a system of um, uh, as a matter of course enforcement, then we have an issue. Um, uh, it may also uh, weaken also the enforcement of Articles 101 and 102, also from the point of view of resources. I can tell you that uh, these exercises take huge resources. I mean, and uh, resources are not uh, indefinite. You know, they they are finite in a way. Um, now, will it work in a more participative uh, way, etc.? We will see. We will see in the first cases. I mean, I fear that it will not be so participative. I, th I fear it will be quite adversarial, at least 
in the first case is that the European Commission um, will apply the, the tool. Um, and um, yes, I mean, in, in, in that sense, if the Commission intervenes in a self-preferencing case and does not denaturalize uh, Article 102, but instead goes to, to the NCT tool, you might say, oh, from a purist point of view, we are okay because Article 102 is intact. Uh, but, you know, in reality, um, legal certainty will have suffered enormously because essentially you would have a, a conduct which uh, under 101 and 102 is fine, is legal, and then suddenly um, you have a competition authority going through the back door. So, I mean, in, in terms of the result, let's forget about the purist antitrust kind of uh, expert who is fine with this, uh, but in terms of the result and in terms of the particular uh, companies concerned, I mean, this in a way would be even worse. Um, so, you know, it will depend definitely on how far the commission goes, how many times it uses the tool, whether it, it uses it in a very kind of um, reserved way, because again, this is a nuclear weapon and you have to use it very, very carefully. Okay, so I'm going, thank you, Makis. So I'm going to actually jump on what you said to, um, to, to throw a question that came in the chat and uh, the same to Heike. So um, you, you talk about the nuclear option here. And you know, the one question that came in the chat is whether um, using nuclear ammunition in di dynamic digital sectors where we're still you know, on the low end of the learning curve is you know, from a policy, I understand the question to be a policy question, a wise, a wise call for the commission um, in, an, in a you know, process where you have a lot of potential, I read here, unintended consequences, misapplied discretion, regulatory capture. Um, so that's the question to Makis. And then I'll, the question to Heike is sort of follow up to what I asked before. Um, so in the chat, there's a question about whether these NCT remedies will be applied only to specific behaviors and companies or they could be addressed to a market failure situation as happens in the UK market regime and therefore addressed to any potential undertaking. And, and so to, to push that question a little further, I wonder whether beyond the remedy in the sense that we lawyers talk about remedies, the NCT couldn't be used also to you know, be a nice opportunity to have a report which would send signals to other lawmakers other institutions to change something. You know, this sort of idea of sunshine regulation where the NCT would shine a light on a problem and say, you know, this is beyond what conscient remedies can achieve, but it demands action from other walls of government. Um, so I, I wonder whether there's other outputs than conscient remedies have been, have been thought about. So um, maybe Heike first and, and then Makis. Okay, to your last question, Yes, as I think that in, uh, the remedies can be imposed not only on some companies, there is an option to impose them on some companies, but also on all the actors in the market, all the companies that uh, fulfill specific preconditions. So it, that is a quasi-legislative act in that case. And alternatively, and both has been done by the CMA in the UK, alternatively, there could be a proposition to change the law, to say, go to the regulator, for example, and say, impose this type of regulation, please, or go to the legislator and say, please think about whether um, there should be a change in the laws. Both is possible. Um, let me give a very brief remark on the question of the nuclear weapon. Looking, I, I see your point, Marcus, uh, that it's a very far-reaching instrument, and I, I see it in that way myself. It is very far-reaching. Uh, at the same time, we have the experience from the UK, uh, and they have used, if you say, if you uh, call it nuclear weapon, they have used it many times, and they have used it many times in beneficial ways. So I don't think they have abused the instrument. And uh, given this experience, I think, depending on how we handle it, it need not be a complete nuclear option, but it can be a useful option depending on how we 
frame it um, and how the commission then handles it. It also depends on, for example, will the commission impose a breakup as a remedy or will it impose an informational duty upon the companies? These are very different things and, and one will not be that controversial and possibly companies will be willing to cooperate in such a proceeding. Whereas in a proceeding where a company is fearing to be broken up, it probably will not be in a very cooperative mood. I don't think Facebook or Google would be very cooperative and if the commission would threaten uh, to use the NCT to break them up. So depending on, on what the setting is, we will have very different types of problems, I think. Yes, I agree, of course. I mean, it depends how you use it and um, what the behavioral remedy is going to be. Um, of course, the more you go into core business models, uh, um, the more closer you are essentially to a situation which is not so different from a breakup at the end of the day. Um, but um, uh, if I can predict something, I would say it's expect to see more behavioral than structural remedies uh, by the European Commission. It's easier for a national competition authority dealing with a national market in an exceptional case to impose a breakup in a national industry, et cetera, et cetera. But I mean, the European Commission dealing with uh, a global markets, uh, global digital markets will uh, impose a breakup. I mean, forget about it, that, that will not happen. So it's, very, it's more likely it will be behavioral uh, remedies. Now, Nicola, to your question, I didn't quite get it, but you, you were asking the interaction with 101 and 102, uh, if, that what, if that's what you were asking, my, my sense is that um, if you have this tool and you have also 101 and 102, if you handle it carefully, if you handle it well, then um, it can be beneficial maybe in some situations for 101 and 102 because companies may decide to be uh, more cooperative or they can think of... Um, um, uh, they can think of um, um, uh, an easier way to adopt commitments, you know, which I believe at least are the best place to achieve certain results. Um, I uh, remind you of uh, the Microsoft cases. I mean, the first remedy and the second remedy, which was um, not imposed, but was agreed with, uh, with a company. So if a company knows uh, that, um, uh, oh, I have this 102 proceeding and uh, um, yeah, it's either um, a billion euro fine and then, you know, remedies, etc. But um, there's also the possibility of the NCT. Um, they could uh, unleash the dogs against me or whatever. So maybe that may also uh, make it easier for um, uh, a company to be more forthcoming when it comes to commitments. I, I'm not sure whether this is what you were asking, but uh, I'm just throwing uh, some views here. Yeah, I'm not even sure about the question I asked you um, and which one it was. <laughs> but um, I, I think your point, the point you're making is interesting in the sense that you know, there's two ways to go if you want to do more commit commitments. Uh, either you remove some procedural hurdle in the standard 101 or 102 proceeding, and so you try to remove some inefficiency here, or you try to, in the procedure, so if it's about being fast, we often hear that when we talk about the NCT, a lot of the discussion is about let's be fast, let's be fast, let's be fast. I think there's a little more to it than just uh, being fast, you know, if we want to push the boundaries of competition to information problems. Which is not true, by the way, eh? because the, the CMA cases are far from being fast, you know, they, they right. take ages sometimes. Eh? So, but, so you can remove some procedural stuff here uh, and so some sort of internal administrative in inefficiency in the agency maybe, or you can do what the NCT proposes to do, which is to remove the conduct components and focus on the outcome market failure and the outcome market without the failure. Um, you know, and I, I mean, I, I'm just throwing that here. I, I, I sort of, it, there's not only one way to think about how to, you know, go faster. Uh, you know, it can be removing the substantive component or it can be about uh, working with, with other t tools. Um, we have, I, if the participants allow me, because we started just a little two minutes late, um, I would like to maybe ask one last question or maybe one last set of remarks to, to the 
uh, participants, all the, all the questions are in the chat, so we can get back to them and we have the full afternoon. There's one question I really want to ask to Heike, and um, uh, the same to, to Makis to some extent. So Heike, you've been writing the report with Jacques Rémer and Pierre-Yves de Montjoie, and now you've been writing this report. What did you learn in that process? I would be, you know, the sort of, you know, in terms of, you know, what do you get out of that, you know, working with the agency, the sort of sense about the problems unfolding around us. What's your sort of retrospective, you know, uh, takeaway from this, you know, incredible and unique experience that you have, uh, having been, you know, so close to to the policymaking world. So that's one question I have. And and you, Makis, you know, you've been seeing this thing unfolding for the past you know, three or four years, but as you said, you were in the agency before, we know the CMA regime. What's your sort of, you know, long-term historical perspective on, on what's, what's happening? Heike? Well, a difficult question. So many things you learn. It is a privilege, of course, to, to interact in this way with um, people from the commission. I think what I've learned really during this report is the importance of procedure. So that um, for many, aspects um, like moving fast indeed we want to move fast in these markets um, we can't Can, is it the reason why we cannot move fast is that the reason that article 101 and article 102 are so different from the nct the, as you say the move the conduct compo component and you can be much faster i don't think this is it um, because uh, even in the nct proceeding also you said this marcus you said we should only look at um, at structure and not at conduct, but frequently these two are mixed. You cannot clearly separate and say this is structure and has nothing to do with conduct, but conduct coming into a specific market structure will cause a problem. So you have to do you have to do both. You have to look at the conduct. You don't have to prove an infringement, but I don't think this is the most burdensome part of Article 101 and 102. I think the burdensome part of these procedures is really the process. And uh, for example, um, ensuring confidentiality and uh, doing access to the file and all of that is really heavy work and it takes a long time. And uh, if you want to move very fast, you would in a way need to find a good way to, uh, to abbreviate that. But this is not so easy because there are procedural guarantees and there are procedural guarantees for a good reason. And um, so I, I really, um, yeah, I thought much more about procedure um, and learned a lot about procedure when doing this report. And I think this is something that somebody like me who mostly focuses on substantive competition law uh, needs to look at more. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. That's very helpful. And, and for me, Nicola, the most, uh, I would say, um, interesting thing to watch uh, throughout these uh, last four or five years is how much the the discussion and the the way of thinking uh, both at the European Commission and with the national competition authorities is in a state of flux. I mean, um, like uh, they are, we are discussing things that three or four years ago we would never, you would never imagine that the European Commission would go for a market investigation system. Um, in fact, my own experience from um, the older days is that the Commission was probably a bit uh, uh, suspicious of those tools, considering them as being too regulatory um, and therefore not for us. Uh, um, certainly. Um, uh, also, the, 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 the questions uh, we have about, um, um, you know, let's uh, deal with uh, results, uh, let's deal with outcomes, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, and also with regard to, to digital, you know, um, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, in six months time uh, the Commission goes for an abuse of economic dependence uh, uh, legislation, eh, which like uh, like last year, I mean, or two years ago, was anathema, you know, to, to speak of an uh, of um, abuse of economic dependence as a as a kind of normal competition law um, uh, tool, let's say. But you know, I, I'm I'm never surprised any longer with what I see. I mean, <laughs> that's my that's my main uh, point here. <laughs> that's a that's a, a great uh, remark. So. Okay, so it's time to, to wrap up. Um, as our speakers explained, um, there's a lot of innovation 
in the legal and regulatory um, domain here. Um, as Ike just mentioned, it's important not to, um, you know, uh, forget the procedural and um, uh, constraints, decisional constraints that bear on the agency, but also that you know for good reason that uh, that have to be uh, that have to be observed. So um, there will be a lot of time in the next sessions to discuss the rest. I think that was a good um, opener for the um, uh, today's uh, events. I want to thank again Heike Schweitzer and Asimakis Kamnenos for their uh, very uh, thoughtful presentations and remarks and uh, all the questions stay in the chat. We will resume at 1, 1 p.m. So that's in about four, 54 minutes. So join us again for the next session uh, with uh, chaired by Pierre Luigi Parcou on the interplay between the new legislation and sector specific regulation in the EU. A round of applause, virtual applause for our speakers. Thank you.